Galaxy Quest is a 1999 film written by David Howard, whom apparently does not really exist. It was directed by Dean Pariseau, a name you know from directing four episodes of Justified, the film Red 2, Fun with Dick and Jane, and a bunch of other TV shows. He gets a lot of work, and generally it's quite admirable. Whoa, slow down with the hyperbole there, Newman. Their work is generally quite admirable. That's like the new Have a Great Summer with an eight. Though he directed an episode of Reading Rainbow in 1989, so he must be pretty cool. Wait, hang on. This movie came out the same year as The Phantom Menace? I'm not sure why that feels weird to me, but it feels weird to me. It might be because The Phantom Menace feels like somebody turned a coloring book into a, a film. 99 was a good year for that. Honestly, I don't really know how Galaxy Quest happened. Classic is a term I don't throw around all that often, especially as it pertains to comedies, because I just don't think there's that many comedy classics. The reason being is that I think there's a lot of sort of personalized criteria for everyone as it pertains to that word. A comedy classic to me seems to consist of a list of criteria that I just invented. Yep, that's fair. That's how it works. Okay, cool. I love you guys. Number one, it's a genre picture choosing to ground their film in a crafted universe and reality. Two, the jokes in the comedy are timeless in execution without an over-reliance on pop culture to drive your humor. Three, the film is cinematic in scope and actually uses the format to make a piece of art. Number four, the story and the dangers inherent to it are real to the characters within it. Comedies deserve real stakes just like anything else. Five, generally it involves an ensemble cast that perfectly captures exactly what the film is going for. I'll be upfront and say that I think Ghostbusters is as close to my criteria of a classic as possible. I used to watch it every day when I was five years old, but I didn't think it would still be one of my favorites of all time as an adult, but it is shot on 70 millimeter, which makes a pretty bold statement about cinematic aspirations as they pertain to 1980s comedy. I'm going to discuss this film based on those criteria I just set up. That's fun. That's a fun afternoon activity for all of us to do uh, together. Apparently I'm your stepdad now, everyone. How's, how's your grades? Maybe let's play putt-putt sometime. Don't tell your mama I gave you that beer. This got real weird, I'm sorry. <laughs> Galaxy Quest is a genre picture through and through. In fact, their world building is second to none. I mean, you want to talk about being ahead of the curve. This film was incorporating fandom as a B-plot, perfectly executed B-plot, mind you, long before conventions and fandoms were appearing in any form of media really at all. Obviously, the allusions to Star Trek and his fans are not accidental, but instead of just sending up Star Trek as a straight-up spoof would do, generally just recreating scenes like Freeberg and Seltzer would do. Oh, sorry, whoops, those are the assholes that made great movie, epic movie, the Spartan disaster, vampires, the starving. Wait, what? The Starving Games? Holy shit, that was a movie? They're still making this shit? Okay, on behalf of everyone ever, speaking from a position of authority and strength, stop hurting us. No, this movie tells its own story with its own characters in a way that might resemble Star Trek, but it still feels like its own thing. The only thing they really lifted from a Trek film is that some of the scenes are pulled from beats uh, in a traditional sort of Star Trek story. Sure, we have scenes like where Gwen has to repeat everything the computer says, but it's a send-up of the gender politics of the television shows in the 60s through the 80s. This film created a television show in a specific time period and decided to tell the story of people who don't feel like they have a place in the world. They were on TV and now they're not. So at the moment the Thermians take them, they're given a, a very real purpose. It's not punching down on Trek and fandom. It's saying, it's okay if you structure a life around the entertainment that you love and meet like-minded people to pursue your idea of happiness. What makes this particular comedic example so potent is that the actors and characters they played on the television show are pretty much polar opposites. Captain Taggart is smart, fearless, and the perfect leader that never lets his crew down, but Jason Nesmith is a hack, alcoholic frat hole of a man that lets all of his co-stars down constantly. Lieutenant Madison is a subservient, manufactured sex object who is supposed to do everything that Taggart says, no questions asked, but Gwen DeMarco always speaks her mind and generally is the captain of the ship for more than half the film. Also, she looks at Jason as the sex object, which is kind of a nice role reversal. Dr. Lazarus is a hyper-intelligent alien that has a broad reach over technology and anatomy, whereas Alexander, the consummate actor, doesn't even know how to hold his tricorder thing correctly, and they all kind of make fun of him for it. You were holding it upside down. Shut up. And of course, the foremost engineer in the universe, Tech Sergeant Chen, is a nervous moron named Fred Kwan, who, when attempting to digitize a target to teleport to the ship, well, it doesn't go so hot. <laughs> some squealing or something. Everything's fine. But the animal is inside out. 
And it exploded. But that's his character's arc in the film. It's only when Jason, acting as a captain, does a pep talk for Fred, leading him to believe in himself enough to teleport him back without Tim Allen turning inside out and exploding. Which is the moment the punches start landing in this movie, before we have a moment to breathe and think maybe these guys have a chance. We learn that Jason possibly maybe got the entire Thermian home planet destroyed. It's not super clear on the timeline here. He was either destroyed after his first interaction or well before then. They talk about it like it's an ongoing struggle, so it's kind of a gray area. But he was super hungover and didn't take the villain's threat seriously, so he could have been responsible for the death of billions. And the movie tries to balance moments like this, allowing every character to shine in this context. It reincorporates elements from all over the movie into its climax, like any good episode of a science fiction show would do. The rock monster returns to wreak havoc on their enemies. They beat a superior ship that had them outgunned by outsmarting it. Jason even gets to say one of those awesome Captain One-liners. Yo, he dragging minds though. Think about this. Dr. Lazarus has the stupidest catchphrase of all time, spending a fair chunk of screen time basically showing you how dumb and reductive it is. Only to switch that shit up in the third act and make that phrase mean enough to make you actually cry. By Grabthar's hammer, by the sons of Warvan, you shall be avenged. Damn, Alan Rickman, you are missed friend. I mean, look how many episodes of the show he's appeared in. That's not a thing I plan. That's just how often he pops up in films that I happen to love. And I'm really sad he's gone. It sucks. <laughs> this movie is funny, hilarious even, monumentally so. Something comedies often use as a crutch is offsetting their budget with product placement, which can date a film in a matter of years, and making references to popular culture and the like can set a film in a time period so concretely that it might not even be funny to people five years later. <laughs> Down the hall and to the left. This movie does neither. And I'm talking about something that happens a lot with those Judd Apatow era improvisational comedies. When you're making up jokes on the spot, while often hilarious in the moment, they tend to die in the vine the longer they're out in the ether. It starts to falter big time. I mean, how often are you throwing the 40-year-old virgin and knocked up into your DVD players? And in this film, this is not accidental. No one wears logos on their shirts. No one has any brands or anything in their rooms and houses. It's designed to be as funny now as it was, you'll want to sit down for this, 17 years ago. Oh, This film creates comedy in so many ways. It's got physical comedy, dialogue comedy, visual comedy, inside out lettuce dog monster comedy, you know, all the good kinds of comedy. I don't move to demonize making fun of brands and trying to create entertainment out of poking fun at things in popular culture that exist in our world. Lord knows Chris and I have pretty much built a following on that. But I think for a comedy to achieve the height of modern classic, it's gotta be able to hold up, you know, 20 years later or 60 years later. <laughs> comedy and the art of film haven't always been the nicest of bedfellows. I'm not saying that a comedy film needs grand cinematic aspirations to be funny or have value to an audience, but I do think that comedy films are better when they're measured on the metrics of the art form. When things are made well, we tend to like them more. Heck, even the decision to shoot the movie in 235 by one sort of forces you to care about framing in a way that traditional 16 by nine wouldn't force you to. By constricting your frame, you force the film to have a grander scope. But did you know? In the original theatrical version, the film was shown in three aspect ratios, not the two seen on the home video release. The full frame television stuff is still there, but every scene that takes place on Earth before Jason gets to space was in 177 by 1, 16 by 9. As the doors open, showing him the vast universe before him, the curtains widened in the theater and spread out to CinemaScope, allowing the audience to feel what Nesmith is feeling. Awe. And I think one of the easiest ways to illustrate comedy through the lens of cinema is to look at a film like Tropic Thunder. I mean, that movie is crazy as hell, but it looks like a 1970s era war film because that's the joke. The art of their construction is the joke, which is kind of how I see my show. At its heart, this is a comedic look at films I love, but it doesn't stop me trying to make art and put it out in the world. Comedy can absolutely be art, and I think it's loftier, personally, to dream in those terms. And this would be the part where I'd bring up Edgar Wright and I'd flaunt all over his cinematic artistry like a middle schooler at a Jane's Addiction concert. Or I don't even know what that joke means. What the f*** am I doing? Goodbye. <laughs> Character stakes that mean something to an audience. We believe in these characters and their goals because their successes and failures have value to us. Cringe comedy is kind of the logical antithesis to this or the idea that you can be funny by consistently making your audience hate your characters and squirm 
in their seats as they take their clueless hate farming to a relentless and off-putting extreme. This is the Danny McBride, Jody Hill playbook. Observe and report, eastbound and down, and vice principles are all fruits of this team up. The characters never learn shit, and their whole purpose is to exist to make every other character on screen feel uncomfortable, and the comedy is wrung from the stone in that way. Now, I like all these examples, but they can be really hard to watch sometimes because, and I think this is pretty true of most humans, our humanity will at some point get in the way because we're attempting to use normal human empathy to relate to these characters on screen instead of laughing at them. Every person has a threshold for how much we can watch characters endure before we give up on the whole thing, comedy or not. There's other examples, of course. The Office is easily the best example, and if you watch through again, you'll realize that it clicked with an audience in season two. And what happened in season two? Michael Scott, human dumpster fire, became the foil, not the main character. By shifting the focus of the story onto Jim and Pam and their continuing will they won't they struggle, suddenly Michael can play the part of the foil, allowing us to root for characters we can actually empathize with. And if we can't empathize with your story and characters, then we're probably not going to remember it as anything other than disposable comedy. And our characters in Galaxy Quest are up against a whole lot. We grow our empathy organically. The Thermians are silly life forms that are off-putting to an audience by design. And as we spend time getting to know them, in some cases watching them get hurt by their own naivete, it engenders within us a compassion for them and their struggles. We watch them sacrifice and die and fight to exist by the end of it. We love them. We care about the stakes in this story because they feel entirely real to the characters within it. Stakes absolutely matter in a comedy. <laughs> My god, the cast of this movie is a tangerine dream from heaven floating down a river of chocolate fondue and an assortment of sugary marvels. Hey Tom, do you have that music guys? Yeah, that's my jam, son. This film stars Tim Allen, fresh off the success of Jungle to Jungle, The Santa Claus, For Richer, For Poorer, and Beat While He's Put- What the f- Seriously? Are these real movies? Are these real movies? They look like the fake movies in the background of a Judd Apatow film. I don't get it. Sigourney Weaver, who is an absolute dream in this movie and is totally game for anything this film throws at her, including... What did you know? In the scene where Gwen is freaking out about the crushers in the hallway, she says, Oh, screw that, and we move on. But if you watch her mouth, you can clearly tell that she said something else and they got scared about dropping an F-bomb in what is otherwise a pretty all-ages appropriate film. And when I get to Alan Madoff and Rackman, he's perfect. Everything he says in this movie is quotable until the end of time and by Grapthar's hammer, you will be missed. Truly. Tony Shalhoub, at this point in his career, had done a few television appearances uh, in addition to his stint on Wings, but he was more of a call-in character actor at the time. Ain't nobody know that he was gonna come into this movie, seemingly throw all of the direction or logic for how this character should say any of his lines and basically turn every single thing he says into comedy gold. Seriously, think about this character as how he appeared in the script. Because if you think about his lines as if they were delivered off the page by another actor, they're pretty much all straight man lines to push other people's comedy, and he hijacks literally every scene like a champ. Tony Shalhoub is amazing. I'm not sure Monk would exist if he hadn't done this movie. Sam Rockwell, before he'd done damn near anything of merit. I mean, with this and Charlie's Angels not long after, it pretty much put Sam Rockwell on the shortlist for pretty much anything he wanted to do. Do you want to you be friends, Sam Rockwell? I have Pop-Tarts and Bagel Bites and Diet Blackberry Shasta. But here's some of the ones you probably forgot or didn't realize were in this movie, because how about none other than Veronica Mars's dad himself, Enrico Colantoni. Or, you know, Rain Wilson, aka Dwight Schrute. Yeah, that's him. Or pre-Macintosh ruined his life, Justin Long, who got the Macintosh gig because of this movie, ergo Galaxy Quest ruined Justin Long's life. Hashtag rip back boy or Kevin McDonald. This film has so much going for it. Movies like this come along once in a blue moon, generally all trying to make a film in the vein of Ghostbusters, but more often than not, you end up making evolution. And how often has somebody brought up that movie? I'm not sure the people in it even remember making it. Score one for the touchdown boys because it took me a bit to really figure out the angle I wanted to attack this film from. Sitting down to watch it again, I realized that the angle I wanted to hit it from was what I really thought of it. It's a classic comedy film and I think it should be remembered as such. <laughs> 
Thanks for checking out our channel. If you're new here, here's some thoughts on what you should check out next. Obviously, there's a lot of episodes of Movies of Mikey to check out, but if I could recommend Local 58 Chris Straub's epic YouTube horror series, and then there's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, a radio play that I readapted back into this format. If you wanted to ever see what it would look like if I made a film, then I would suggest you check this out because it's what happens when I make an animated film. Also, we have animated shorts. Also, also, we have the Fantastic Port Center, Ben Patton Show. Basically, our channel is awesome, and you should check out all of it and like, subscribe, and tell your friends this is where the damn party is at. Because it is. On to the voting. Nah, <laughs> just kidding. The next video is this. Which you would have known last month if you followed me on Twitter. Go do it. I'll wait. I post all Movies and Mikey related news there. Everyone that follows me is cooler than all their friends because they have the inside skinny on Mikey and his movies. At Mikey Face, do it. Right now. Do it. Shit, just go send me a message. I'll probably reply to it if you do. I mean, I'm not really doing anything. Jesus, this is a long episode. Goodbye!